You are listening to the Lifeboat Credit Podcast, credit talk for the modern economy. You have credit questions, we have credit answers. Building it up, repairing it, and utilizing it to create financial security for you and your family. What can I do to repair my credit? Is credit repair confusing? Should I make my payments early? What's the credit restoration process like? Qualifications. You're approved. Minimum payment. Where do the credit bureaus come from? I wish there was an easy way to make sense of it all so I could understand it better. Why do I need to know any of this? This is credit repair for the modern economy. It's how credit repair should be. We're going to rebuild and restore your credit and be with you every step of the process. Welcome to the Lifeboat Credit Podcast. We are credit talk for the modern economy. On this podcast, we bring you open discussion on all things credit related, including repairing and rebuilding it, using it, and benefiting from it. Credit is something that is definitely not talked about or discussed enough in our society, and it doesn't have to be confusing or a foreign concept, so we are here to unpack it a bit. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us. We are thrilled that you're here with us today. It's our goal on this podcast to educate, equip, and help as many people as possible, maximize their credit scores, and acquire the tools and leverage necessary to fight back against the unfair credit and financial systems. I'm Andrew. I'm your podcast host, and I got into credit repair after having my own credit get messed up, and then I learned everything I could about it and the steps to fix it. If that's you right now, I can relate. If not, congratulations on your good credit and staying ahead of the game so you don't need to play catch up like the rest of us. And now we are going to dive right into today's episode. Since we're just starting out the podcast, I thought it would be a good idea to start at the beginning to give everyone a chance to get on the same page. Today's episode is going to be sort of a broad overview of the ins and outs of the credit system in our country and what credit means in modern economic terms. We're going to cover credit in the present day, its history, where the big bad credit bureaus come from. We're also going to break down credit reports and credit score and how it's calculated. Also, be prepared to hear a bit about the pros of having good credit and cons of having poor credit. And we'll see how credit repair and rebuilding uh, credit back up can have such a significant impact on tons of different parts of your life. Most importantly, saving you lots of money and enabling a whole new world of financial security that we all strive for. And the goal here, everybody, on this podcast is also to have these concepts sort of become more familiar to you so that they don't seem scary or foreign or confusing and just to normalize them because your credit is super important and it's really not talked about a whole lot. So we're excited to break it down for you starting right now. Are you ready? Let's get started. If you're anything like the vast majority of people, when I say credit, you have a concept of what that means or are loosely familiar with it. The first thing that might come to mind when I say credit our credit cards. Or maybe you thought of the old-fashioned term of buying something on credit. Maybe you thought about your credit score or the credit bureaus. Or maybe you thought of the app Credit Karma. Or possibly that shot you back into third grade and now you're thinking about some extra credit classwork assignments you had once to bump up your final grade. That's not the type of credit we're talking about here in this episode, but the rest of them are related. All right, so credit, what is it? And what does it mean in today's financial marketplace? Credit is, essentially, the ability to borrow money for purchases now with a promise to pay later. It's more or less a record keeping of your personal and financial information. An official definition of credit could be something like confidence in a purchaser's ability and intention to pay and entrusting the buyer with goods or services without immediate payment. So if you've been shopping and ever heard of someone buying something on credit, that means the seller makes a judgment call whether the buyer would be able to pay them for the item in the future based on the buyer's credit history. If they determine you are a low risk and will likely pay them back, they will sell you the item on credit with terms to pay back. We're all pretty familiar with this, right? Here's an example of borrowing and buying on credit that I bet you've been a part of one way or another, even if you've never had a credit card or our experience with financing or have financed anything a day in your life. 
What about when your friend or family asks you to borrow money? Yes, the infamous family friend lend. You reflect back and ask yourself, what are the chances I am actually getting that money back? So you would be the lender or the creditor in this case, and your friend or family member would be the borrower who wants to borrow money to get something now with a promise to pay you back later. Are you already thinking about stories that have happened in the past? Thanksgiving seven years ago, Uncle Ricky, that one time that one friend swore it was a sure thing and that they would have you paid back in no time plus some. Personally, I think there's a general rule of thumb. If you're lending money to friends or family, it's probably not wise to anticipate those funds being repaid in full. And if you're lending money to friends or family, or really just anybody, but especially friends or family, I guess, it's best to do it with an open and generous heart and do it because you want to give and to help. Because oftentimes these types of borrowing situations are not repaid 100% in full. But for better or for worse, banks and businesses do not operate like we do with Uncle Ricky. I'm thinking that's probably for the better. They have strict guidelines that they adhere to when deciding whom to lend and who to extend credit to and how much money will they lend and how long will they give to pay it back? What terms will they set? And at what interest rate? Will it be high or low? And will they lend to you again or just that once? If consumers will say anything just to get a loan these days, how do banks and businesses know who to trust? How do they know who will pay them back or not? How do they gather whether or not that person would be a good candidate for a line of credit or for a loan or determine what kind of business that individual has done in the past, or if they uh, have a positive or negative borrowing and payment history. The answers to these questions are all impacted by a consumer's credit history. And once we're done examining the basic ins and outs of credit here in this episode, you'll be able to address all these questions and more. So in order to track customer data all over the world, not just from our family, but everybody, every single person, all their purchases, all their payment history, for the purpose of this podcast and episode, I'll say everyone in the United States, but in reality, in today's economy, these companies absolutely track customer data globally. But in order to track it all, companies get consumer data from other companies that use credit reporting systems and generate consumer credit reports. We call these credit reporting companies or credit reporting agencies that distribute the reports credit bureaus. And you can think of credit reports more or less as your financial report card. And these reports show a financial credit score that is unique to each person, just like your report card would show your final grade for that period in school. That credit score is a reflection of the individual's credit history in those credit reports over a period of time. And it's calculated by a variety of factors. And just a tidbit of information on other countries' credit systems, each country has their own credit system. So if you are from the United States, your credit score and credit history are unique to the United States and will not transfer to any other countries. Now, if you have bad credit, I know what you're thinking. We can all move to Costa Rica and start fresh. Yes. And I'd say that's not such a bad idea. So I'll mention this fun fact as well, which is that all U.S. jurisdictions, including the five inhabited U.S. territories, have the same credit reporting systems as the U.S. This includes American Samoa, Guam, the Northern Mariana Islands, U.S. Virgin Islands, and probably most famously, Puerto Rico. So if you have plans to move abroad to somewhere tropical, look into the U.S. territories if you don't want to start your credit history from scratch. But for those of us planning to stay in the United States, you're stuck with your credit history and credit score. The good news is it can be changed. So your past credit does not have to be a reflection of your credit moving forward. All right, so I would like to briefly outline and review the major concepts of today's episode. We have four major terms we're going to be narrowing in on today. First, we have credit. Credit is the ability to borrow money for the things you need now with a promise to pay later. It's basically a seller's confidence in a buyer's ability to pay for goods or services at a future date. Next, we have credit bureaus or credit reporting agencies. These are big data collecting and data reporting organizations. Essentially, they are institutions that collect consumer financial data by tracking their financial transactions. Then they generate and distribute this consumer financial information in the form of credit reports. The three main bureaus are TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian. Next up are credit reports, essentially your financial report card of your life. 
These reports are created and generated by the credit bureaus and contain information such as previous addresses and previous employers, your current debt and open and closed loans, open and closed accounts, and a bunch of other personal and financial information. There's a bit more to them, but we'll get more into the credit bureaus and, and reports here later on. And last, we have credit score, a three-digit number that represents financial credit worthiness. It's the score you get on your financial report card, your financial GPA. Basically, it's a number that predicts how loanable you are or how likely you are to pay back a loan. So your credit score is calculated based on information contained in credit reports. It's made up of several different components that each carry a different weight, such as payment history, like if you pay your bills on time, your credit utilization rate, and some other factors. You can think of your credit score as a representation of your overall credit health. We're also going to dive more into how credit score is calculated and how it's broken down later today as well. But so far, those are the four main terms that we're getting into. Credit, credit bureaus, credit reports, and credit score. We begin our journey with credit. Credit is the first character we encounter in our story. The idea of credit contains value in more ways than one. For example, it's useful. Credit is useful because it allows business transactions to run smoother, reducing friction. It also allows companies to get more business and make more money where they couldn't otherwise and allows customers to enjoy goods and services they wouldn't or couldn't otherwise because they can break it up into payments and can pay in the future and don't have to pay for the whole thing uh, all at once. And it allows relationships and also importantly trust to be built and forged between vendors and consumers and lenders and businesses. And basically everyone can participate in the credit system to their benefit. Credit cards are a good example of a modern day use of credit where you put the balance of an item on the credit card and then pay it off later in a given amount of time. But in the old days, I'm not so sure they were swiping their American Express. So what would they do? They would trade their oldest born son, of course. No, they would most certainly not do that. Let me address this by illustrating a quick little story. In the old days, we're talking around a little over 400 years ago, which brings us to around the time of Galileo and the invention of the telescope. That's all they were doing 400 years ago, just looking up at the sky all day and night. They were not worried about their credit. Back around this time in the early 1600s, there were companies founded in the Netherlands and in Britain called the Dutch East India Company and the British East India Company. So the Dutch East India Company was officially established March 20th, 1602, and is often officially considered the first truly multinational corporation as it had investors and headquarters in several different countries. The British East India Company was founded two years earlier, in fact, in the year 1600, and was backed by the Queen, for crying out loud, the Queen of England. So these businesses were like the first of their kind, enormous enterprises, doing business across the globe, traveling country to country by sea, and these companies were flourishing like nothing the world had ever seen, as they were establishing trade routes of that size and scale across the globe for the first time. The main product categories that were imported and exported were furs, cloth, and spices, and they were doing a lot of business. Extensive research determines that the Dutch East India Company was worth 78 million Dutch guilders at its peak, which is equivalent to a whopping, ready for this, $7.9 trillion in modern dollars. To put that into perspective, Apple, which is currently the largest company in the world, has a value just barely north of 3 trillion, 3.02 trillion to be exact. To put it into clearer perspective, at its peak, the Dutch East India Company was worth more than Apple, Google, Amazon, Walmart, JP Morgan Chase, Ford, Chevy, McDonald's, Coca-Cola, and Johnson & Johnson combined, with more than $200 billion left over. This makes the Dutch East India Company the single most valuable company to ever exist in the history of the world. Following the pioneering footsteps of global capitalism in the 16 and 1700s and fast forward into the 1800s and the world was ripe with businesses ranging from small mom and pop shops and local vendors all the way to these multinational corporations doing all types of business all over the place. And it was through this steady evolution of a developing global trade network that deemed a consumer credit system necessary to be established. There were simply just too many moving parts now. Shopkeepers, grocers, tailors, and especially big business had a new problem of trying to weed out unreliable consumers 
and identify whom to actually trust and whom to invest in. For the first well-documented time in history, consumer credit was incorporating itself into the very fabric of American life. As we have outlined, the history of American consumer credit was not first created with the invention of credit cards, but rather has a history that dates much further back. The first consumer credit bureaus actually popped up in the 1870s, with commercial credit reporting firms emerging as early as the 1840s. These credit reporting companies began to accumulate humongous archives of consumer financial data. The approach in the late 1800s and early 1900s was basically individuals and businesses going from merchant to merchant, taking notes about the people with whom they had payment arrangements for goods and services purchased on credit. These notes could say anything from simply marking that the customer is reliable and always pays the debt, to even mentioning cosigners such as family members who would cover the debt in uh, the event the original customer couldn't. Armed with these new scrupulous, personal, and detailed notes on consumers purchasing and payment trends, merchants were able to contact local credit reporters and use this to their advantage to obtain information that they had about a person in their file. Over time and continuing into the present day, these credit reporters managed to grow and grow in scale and develop an incredibly detailed, incredibly enormous, vast, and perhaps most stunningly, invisible surveillance network that monitors you, monitors, tracks, and records every single decision that you make pertaining to your finances. To quote Josh Lauer in his book, Creditworthy, quote, the Consumer Credit Bureau was a vital information infrastructure upon which American consumer capitalism was built, end quote. Today, the three primary credit bureaus, TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian, rest amongst the most powerful institutions in our country, yet most of us know virtually nothing about them. Interesting, huh? These three big credit bureaus govern so many parts of our life, they operate almost completely clandestine. So who, or what, are the three big credit bureaus exactly, and why should you care? These three big credit bureaus are, again, TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian. And you should care because the three companies control more of your life behind the scenes than you probably know. Again, the idea of credit bureaus comes from a slow evolution of individuals collecting detailed notes on merchants to vet them for business transactions where they would pay on credit. Over hundreds of years, this note-keeping transformed into the three main credit bureaus keeping tabs on Americans' financial history and everyone's financial history. It was also through this very conversion of an individual's reputation into a financial one that the credit bureaus accomplished something much greater than simply quantifying an individual's financial summary. They really created what we now know as modern financial identity. Taking a quote again from Josh Lauer's Creditworthy, quote, more than any other institution, the Consumer Credit Bureau formalized financial identity as an integral dimension of personal identity and established a technological framework for predicting credit risk and extracting debts, end quote. Do these guys precisely sound like the guys that we want lording over our credit and creditworthiness? I am not so sure about that. So why do I keep referring to them as the three big credit bureaus? Because in reality, there are hundreds, probably thousands of different credit reporting agencies, but these are just small players. Anyone only really cares about the three big bureaus, TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian. So those are the ones we're gonna focus on. Recall that these credit bureaus are nothing more than large data processing centers. They collect consumer financial data by tracking their financial transactions, and then they generate, distribute, and sell this information as credit reports. Here's a quick breakdown of the three bureaus. Equifax is the oldest of the three major credit bureaus founded in the 1890s. It claims to house information on over 800 million consumers in 24 countries worldwide. Its headquarters is in Atlanta, Georgia. Experian is the largest of the three major credit bureaus with 2022 revenues over $6.2 billion. It's not much older than Equifax as their website touts that they have been, quote, helping consumers for over 125 years. They operate globally in over 30 countries, and the company is headquartered in Dublin, Ireland. Next, we have TransUnion, our third bureau. It's the youngest of the three and appears in 1968. 
Their website claims they have a credit file on, quote, nearly every credit active consumer in the United States. And they do business in uh, over 30 countries worldwide, providing service to approximately 45,000 businesses and 500 million consumers. They are headquartered in the Windy City, Chicago. In short, these bureaus collect consumer financial information and then sell it to creditors and lenders. And here's a fun fact about the three big credit bureaus that will shock your boots right off. All three of them are publicly traded companies. Yes, that's right, folks. They not only control the American credit system and everyone under its wing, but they make boatloads of money off the very consumer they claim to help. We're talking in the billions. Okay, added together, we're talking in the tens of billions in revenue last year in 2022 alone. I was just shocked when I found out that you could actually buy shares of these credit bureau stock on the stock market just like any other company. I don't know, I guess I always just naively imagined them to be like privately held or at least like a branch of some subsection of the U.S. Treasury, but nope, now their secret's out and these credit bureaus are just regular profit-seeking companies that have to satisfy their shareholders just like any big company, Walmart, Google, Bank of America, etc. All right, everyone. So by now, hopefully we understand the idea of credit and the credit bureaus a little bit better. And these terms are becoming a little clearer and less confusing. If you need a break, now would be a good time to pause and go get up and stretch and move around or go refill your water bottle or whatnot, because we are a moving train and we are going to keep on going, baby. So the next item up on our list to discuss is the credit report, the all-important financial report card generated by the credit bureaus. I like to talk about your credit report like a financial report card because that's essentially what it is. It kind of keeps track of your financial progress and then gives you a grade. A credit report can be defined a bit more officially as a record of a borrower's credit history from a number of sources, including banks, credit card companies, collection agencies, and governments. A typical credit report contains several different sections, typically up to nine. All credit reports are going to have a personal information section, including your legal name, aliases, uh, current and previous address, employment information, date of birth, etc. The next section would show your credit score from the three different bureaus and provide any risk factors, such as a large number of unpaid collection accounts, or too recent opening of accounts or a bunch of other factors. Next, you'd have a summary section that outlines your past and uh, present credit status, including open and closed accounts and balance information. This is where you would see your total number of accounts and the ones that are positive or delinquent, closed, in collections, or paid off. Next would be an account history section that actually shows any accounts you currently have or have had in the past. For example, it would show like the actual accounts for credit cards, any financing you've done, like cars, jewelry, furniture, and even medical bills and uh, student loans are on there. So next, you would have a section that displays just your inquiries. If you're not too familiar with what these are, we'll get into that in another episode, but basically inquiries come from businesses obtaining a copy of your credit report to approve or deny a loan. Each time you apply for a loan, this would show up as an inquiry on your credit report. But as a general rule of thumb, the less inquiries, the better. And next, we have a public information section that gives an overview of your public records. So this section includes details like bankruptcy, court records, tax liens, and even child support. These public records are some of the ones that stay in your credit report for the longest. Um, Typically, they remain on there for 7 to 10 years. Next, we have a list of credit contacts, or basically the names and contact information of people or organizations who have obtained a copy of your credit report. Sometimes credit reports will also have a consumer statement section. This is basically where the consumer or individual would have the chance to write any notes, annotating any situation on the report, but this usually does more harm than good, and from what I've learned, we tend to stay away from filling in any consumer statements. So that's how a credit report is broken down, and those are the main sections you can expect to find. Personal information, ones about your scores and risk factors, and overall personal information summary, account history, public records, inquiries, furnisher contacts, AKA creditor contacts. Um, Debt furnisher can be a synonym for a creditor. They both just mean whoever is issuing or responsible for collecting the debt. All right, so thus far we've gone over three of the four main points of the podcast today, awesome. We've gone over credit, credit bureaus, and credit reports. 
which leaves us with only one thing left to unpack, and that thing is the all-elusive, all-important, all-mysterious, three-digit number, your credit score. Now, I'm banking that you all listening right now have a pretty decent grasp of what credit score means. If you're a younger listener and have never heard of a credit score before, well, I appreciate you stopping by and you're about to learn something. But for most adults in the United States, we are at least familiar with what a credit score is, right? You've heard the term. You might even know what your personal credit score is. But what is a credit score really? So credit scores come from credit reports, which come from credit bureaus. Your credit score is a number that sums up your financial reputation, if you will. Uh, They're calculated outcomes representing your overall credit health and how risky or not risky you are to lenders when you ask them for a loan. Consumerfinance.gov defines credit score as a prediction of how likely you are to pay back a loan on time based on information from your credit reports. Okay, that makes sense. Your credit score is a number based on information from your credit reports that tells lenders how good of a candidate you are to obtain approval on a loan or get a line of credit and definitely what interest rate you'll pay. People with better credit scores will always save money. Your credit score is a three-digit number ranging from 350 to 850. And like we've said, it's calculated from information and your credit report. But what information and how is it calculated? You've likely heard of your credit score called a FICO score before. These terms are usually interchangeable for all intents and purposes. The word FICO, F-I-C-O, is an acronym that stands for Fair, Isaac, and Company. Fair and Isaac are the last names of two brilliant guys from the 1950s. Earl Isaac was a mathematician, and Bill Fair was an engineer. And through a stroke of kismet, they connected while working together in the Stanford Research Institute in the early 1950s. No surprise, they both belong there. Armed with $800 and a borrowed computer for their entire project, they set off essentially writing computer programs that could calculate scores that predicted behavior. They launched their first company, Fair Isaac Corporation, in 1956 and snowballed the rest to history. Fair and Isaac invented the software that calculates what is now known as your FICO score, and they made a fortune doing it. Earl Isaac passed away in 1983 and Bill Fair in 1996, but their credit scoring company continues to grow and pull in massive revenue to this day. Their company took in revenues of over $1.4 billion last year in 2022. In today's financial marketplace, it is estimated that 9 out of 10 lenders in the U.S. depend on the FICO scoring model to use for customers. Real quick, here's a fun fact about Earl Isaac, the mathematician behind FICO. Yeah, inventing the FICO scoring model is cool, but here's something that I maybe find even cooler. Apparently, he was the first person to crash a computer by feeding it with a complex mathematical problem it cannot solve. Oh yeah, this happened around the year 1950. Can you guys say OG? It's evident these guys were way ahead of their time in more ways than one. And he was born in Buffalo, New York, which I grew up near, in Jamestown, New York. So now after making this episode, I take a special liking to Earl Isaac. I'm dedicating this episode to him, and then I'm going to get some buffalo wings. So FICO is probably the most famous and uh, popular credit scoring model in the U.S., but in the early 2000s, it did acquire a pretty formidable rival. I'm talking about the Vantage Score. This is the name of the consumer credit scoring model that was introduced by the three big bureaus. Can you name them still? That's right, TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian. So they released this new scoring model as an alternative to the FICO score that had been used for basically 50 years. So hand in hand, the two models are very similar. It's just the Vantage model places slightly different importance or impact on different information in your credit report compared to the FICO model. They're separate companies, but they are similar in that both are credit scoring systems that pull information from credit reports and spit out an overall financial GPA, your credit score. They just calculate it slightly differently. How is your credit score actually calculated? Like what's some of the mathematics behind it? I won't argue that the inner workings of the computer programs or the formulas go way over my head, but I can help simplify how your credit score is calculated for you guys by breaking it down in sort of a pie chart format. So if you took a pie chart that represented your total credit score, each piece of the pie would represent different parts of your credit report 
they each place their own special weight on your overall total score. So like some things matter more than others or some variables take up a bigger piece of the pie than others. Not everything that impacts your credit impacts it equally. There's lots of different advice online of what categories make up what percentage of your credit score calculation. So let me clear this up for everybody. Now we're going to put out another episode in the future just dealing with your credit score and really do a deep dive into how they're calculated. And we're also going to do one on how long items are allowed to remain on your credit report before they legally have to be removed. But for today, I'll just provide a general overview. The biggest portion of your credit score comes from your payment history. It totals about 35% of your total credit score. So in general, late or missed payments hurt your credit score while accounts that are paid on time and that have been open for a while help it or are beneficial to it. About 30% of your credit score comes from your total debt. There are various types of debt, such as revolving and installment debt, but we'll get into that in another episode. Um, For today, just know that the less debt you have in general, the better. So those two things alone account for approximately 65% of your credit score, just those two things, payment history and the amount of debt you have, okay? Next, 15% comes from the length of your credit history. If you're just starting out building your credit, this will automatically be low for you. This is one of the reasons it's beneficial to leave your accounts open even if you don't use them because it establishes what's known as time on file or your credit file age. In general, lenders usually know that the older your credit is, the more stable it is, so... Now we're at 80%, and next we have credit diversity and inquiries, both at 10% each. So credit diversity would be all the different types of credit life experience that you've been a part of. So like, if the only account you've ever had was for an auto loan versus someone with many types of paid accounts, for example. And then inquiries are basically when you give an individual or business permission to pull your credit when you want to buy something on credit or finance something. So a common inquiry reason would be like applying for an auto loan or a furniture loan or any line of credit and even a home depot and macy's credit card or any traditional credit card or even applying um even rental applications for an apartment or townhouse sometimes they can run your credit so these inquiries are called are visible to lenders and they can see they can all see how many times you've asked for financing and then they can see the amount of times you were approved versus declined there are two different types of inquiries and a whole bunch more information on them And we'll cover them in more detail, just like all the other subjects, in a future episode of our podcast. So be sure to check in every once in a while to see what episodes we're going to put out next. And that, everyone, is basically the gist of credit scores and a little bit about what comprises them and how they're calculated. Congratulations, everyone. We are 444. We've covered all the four main subjects I wanted to go over today. Credit, credit bureaus credit reports, and credit score. So I'll post some questions that I might have asked at the beginning of the episode and see how they're hanging in here at the end, all right? So what in the heck is credit and where did it come from? How did modern credit bureaus manage to quantify consumers' financial value and distill it into one three-digit number? And where did your credit score come from and how is it even calculated? Hopefully you feel a bit more confident now addressing questions like these. Here's what you need to know. Your credit score is important. Corey Gray from Credit Repair Cloud sums it up like this. Quote, your credit is your reputation. Once you mess it up, it takes some time to rebuild it. If you guys haven't heard of Corey Gray, check him out. He's really great. He and Daniel Rosen give excellent information on credit repair. You guys check them out sometime. But your credit, you guys, it impacts virtually every aspect of your financial life. And it's basically a sign that you wear around your neck when you go into the bank to ask for a loan that tells the banker how high your interest rate will be. The worse your credit, the higher your rate will be. If you have a good credit score, you'll save lots of money. Knowing this one fact can save you tons of money throughout your life. We will talk about the numerous ways your credit impacts daily life in an upcoming episode. But what you also need to know is that your credit does not have a mind of its own. You can control it. You can learn how to repair it and rebuild it. And you can learn how to manage it. Information is power, guys. Knowledge is power. And then you can learn how to use your credit to your advantage to make your life better. Seriously, sometimes it's just that simple. Here are some quick credit repair facts before we wrap it up today that I thought might pique your interest. Cue our British AI. (laughs) 
ranked number one. 79% of Americans have an error on their credit report. Fact number two, only 1% of the population can achieve a credit score of 850. Fact number three, 24 million Americans have no credit file. That's over 9% of American adults. Fact number four, 33 million American adults with credit files do not have enough credit to generate a credit score. Fact number five, it's actually possible to establish credit without a social security number. That individual would just use their ITIN or individual tax identification number. Fact number six, two people can purchase the exact same car from the same lot at the same time and pay two very, very different final amounts. The one with worse credit will pay tons more in interest. This number amplifies with a bigger purchase like a house. Fact number seven. You can get your credit reports from all three bureaus for free at www.annualcreditreport.com. Beware of anything else illegitimate out there. This is the only source for free credit reports that is authorized by federal law. As an extra bonus, the three big bureaus continue to offer free weekly reports through the end of 2023 in an ongoing response to the pandemic. There is a whole world of credit out there, everyone. We just scraped the surface today and tried to hammer out some basic credit terms and lay a foundation we can go off of from here. I hope you guys picked up some special nuggets along the way. We want everyone to feel empowered with their credit. That's our goal, not timid or embarrassed. Remember that building up your credit does not happen overnight. In fact, it usually takes years of diligence and good habit forming to build up good credit. If you're on your own credit repair journey right now, stay the course, keep learning, keep absorbing information, keep tuning into this podcast, and keep doing what you know you need to do to obtain good credit and start utilizing its benefits. If you found value in our episode today, be sure to check back in the near future because there's going to be a boatload more episodes where this came from. A lifeboat load more. In the next episode, we'll dive a little further into how credit is utilized, the different forms of credit, and talk about how a bad credit score can hurt you and why maintaining a good credit score is so important and how it can benefit your financial life and your life as a whole. Wherever you're listening to us right now, be sure to give us a like or subscribe to our channel. We'd really appreciate it. And for any suggestions, comments, or feedback, you can drop us a line on our social media on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at Lifeboat Credit Repair, or send us an email to sos at lifeboatcreditrepair.com. We're just starting out the podcast and would love all the feedback and help we can get. This was episode number one. So shout out to everyone listening that officially was with us from the beginning. We're always going to be looking for ways to improve. Thank you for lending me your eardrums. I hope you guys had fun. To round it off, I'm going to leave you all with a quote. I'm going to do a quote of the day at the end of each episode. Drop a little extra inspiration there at the very end for you. Today's quote of the day is by Samuel Beckett, Irish novelist, playwright, and poet. And it goes, ever tried, ever failed, no matter. Try again, fail again fail better. Don't you just love that one? Until next time, keep your credit habits healthy, people. As my Papa Pete used to say, the cream of the crop float to the top. And we look forward to seeing your credit flow up and up and up. Bye for now. This has been a production of the Lifeboat Credit Podcast.